Earth's climate shifts between short periods of warm and long, long periods of frigid cold. Based on past patterns, there's reason to think that the current warm period might be nearly done. Is the ice age coming back? Or will human activity swing us wildly in the opposite direction? We live in an ice age. Our geological period is the Quaternary and is characterized by massive glaciation. Vast ice sheets stretching from the Arctic all the way down to the Missouri River through Siberia, much of Europe, and spreading out from all major mountain ranges. Okay, sure. Right now, we're in a brief interglacial phase, a relatively summary stretch in which the glaciers have retreated. But these interglacial periods are short-lived. The Quaternary Ice Age has lasted two and a half million years so far. Its 10 to 15,000 year warm patches are separated by glacial periods that last several times as long. The current respite is called the Holocene Era. And it began around 11,000 years ago. Temperatures rose, glaciers and woolly mammoths migrated north, and humans thrived. This new era of warmth and plenty saw the rise of agriculture, writing, cities, and technology. All of our recorded, even our remembered history is of the Holocene. You might forgive us for imagining that these relatively summary millennia are normal for this planet. That is not the case. The current interglacial is already long. Does this mean that the glaciers are overdue? Is winter coming? To answer these questions, we need to understand what triggers the march of the glaciers and why they eventually retreat. In fact, we know the broad answer to this, even if the details are under debate. Earth's motion around the sun changes, and with it the intensity and distribution of sunlight. It was Serbian scientist Milutin Milankovic who realized that the gravitational tug of Jupiter and Saturn would lead to three periodic shifts that might explain the enormous climatic swings of the Quaternary period. These are the Milankovic cycles. Let me summarize. One, the elongation or the eccentricity of Earth's elliptical orbit shifts from almost completely circular to somewhat more elliptical in a 100,000 year cycle. At the absolute maximum eccentricity, Earth's most distant point from the Sun, the aphelion, is about 13% further than the closest point, the perihelion. One hemisphere will experience summer at aphelion and winter at perihelion, and milder seasons all around. That's the north at the moment. The southern hemisphere is closer to the sun in summer and further in the winter, so more extreme seasons. However, the difference in sunlight intensity due to this difference in distance from the sun is much less than the simple difference due to the seasons themselves. So this shouldn't be a huge effect. Two, the pointing of Earth's axis processes. It rotates 360 degrees over approximately 26,000 years. In addition, the long axis of Earth's elliptical orbit also processes. Together, these two effects define where in the orbit the seasons occur. They combine to produce a 21,000 year cycle called the precession of the equinoxes. So eventually, the North's mild perihelion winter will turn into a cold aphelion winter. And three, Earth's tilt changes. Our spin axis is now tilted at 23 and a half degrees relative to the axis of our orbit. This obliquity oscillates between 22.1 and 24.5 degrees over 41,000 years. High obliquity means more extreme seasons, but it's low obliquity that ultimately leads to a colder global climate because then the highest latitudes where glaciation begins never get much sun. Now, Milankovic predicted that obliquity would drive climate variations because it governs the strength of the seasons. But how can we test this? Paleoclimatology. We can reconstruct our planet's climate history by digging holes. 
First, glacial ice cores. The most famous is the nearly four kilometer deep hole drilled in the Vostok Glacier in Antarctica. This glacier was built up by millennia of snowfall. Each year's layer carries bubbles of the Earth's atmosphere from that time. Isotope ratios and greenhouse gas content in those bubbles traces global climate over the past 420,000 years. Second, oceanic sediment cores reveal the changes in ocean floor sea life whose composition also depends sensitively on ocean temperatures and salinity, and so also on global climate and ice volume. Ocean cores get us a climate record back tens of millions of years. If you look back to the early Quaternary, earlier than say a million years ago, it seems Milankovitch was right. Temperature goes up and down on the roughly 40,000 year time scale of changing obliquity. But then, around eight to 900,000 years ago, something changed. As Earth reached the depth of the current ice age, the cycle shifted. Now, the warm periods come only once every 100,000 years. They seem to follow the change in eccentricity, not obliquity. Every time Earth's orbit becomes more circular, the planet warms and the glaciers go away. As eccentricity increases again, the glaciers return. This is totally weird because eccentricity should produce a much smaller effect than obliquity. So what changed? It's not entirely clear, but it may be that we're now so deep in the ice age that it takes all of the Milankovitch cycles together to cause the glaciers to retreat. Eccentricity and obliquity and precession must line up perfectly. The eccentricity cycle is the longest, and so the shifts correspond to its period. Okay, so we're now in a warm interlude, in the depth of an ice age. You might be wondering, when are the glaciers gonna rush down from the north, bringing polar bears, white walkers, tontons? One thing's for sure, the glaciers will come from the north. The vast oceans of the southern hemisphere provide a powerful buffer against changes in temperature. Ice struggles to build up on water. But even now, northern winters see ice and snow cover the land, all the way down to the continental US, Europe and China. In summer, it retreats completely. But if the climate were a little bit cooler, then summer may not be warm enough to melt all of the winter snow. Then it would build up year after year, slowly creeping south. Now, by themselves, shifts in Earth's orbit aren't enough to radically change climate, but they are enough to trigger positive feedback cycles. As ice cover increases, Earth starts to reflect more incoming sunlight. Its albedo increases. More ice means less absorbed sunlight, lowering global temperature and allowing even more ice to grow. The glaciation initiated by the Milankovitch cycles accelerates. A second feedback cycle is equally important. Cooler oceans are better at absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and so the Earth's natural greenhouse effect is diminished. There is an unfortunate combination of orbital properties that kickstarts this process. First, low obliquity means less overall sun at high latitudes where the glaciers start. Second, high eccentricity means one hemisphere experiences a bad winter at aphelion, further from the sun. Earth also moves slower at aphelion and so those long cold winters are not counteracted by the short, warmer summers. And third, the precession of the equinoxes sends the glacier-prone northern hemisphere into a bitter aphelion winter while the eccentricity is high. So when does this happen next? Well, right now, obliquity is decreasing and it'll bottom out in around 12,000 years. It's currently winter at perihelion in the Northern Hemisphere, but it'll have processed completely to the bad situation in 10,000 years. So over 10 to 12,000 years, all of that points to cooling. What about the 100,000 year eccentricity cycle that seems to define the overall cycle? Well, actually, we're just coming out of a peak in eccentricity. That should have been bad. 
and perhaps it would have meant that the upcoming cooling trend would bring the glaciers with it. However, we may have dodged a bullet. See, the recent eccentricity maximum was a sad little peak, and our orbit remained pretty circular. See, as well as the 100,000 year cycle, there's a longer 400,000 year cycle on top of that. Roughly, every fourth eccentricity peak is very low. That just happened, and the next peak will be weak also. We got lucky. We're in a long, stable, low eccentricity phase. Because of this, climate models predict that we have another 25 to 50,000 years of interglacial period left. And that's only if you ignore anthropogenic climate change. Human influence on the climate messes with the whole equation. With CO2 now at 400 parts per million, it's higher than at any point in the Quaternary period. It's been predicted that this may extend the current interglacial for 100,000 years. So we've probably at least offset the next glaciation, although it wasn't coming anytime soon anyway. The real question is, have we ended the entire Quaternary Ice Age? Also possible, however, the recent increase in greenhouse gases is so large and so sudden that there's no precedent anywhere in the climate record. This makes modeling our influence a huge challenge. But don't mistake that for a lack of certainty. Our influence is certainly enormous. There's another climate extreme that's much less fun than a long mild interglacial. That's a sweltering greenhouse climate like the one that dominated the Mesozoic when the dinosaurs roamed. Or, you know, Venus. See you next week for more cold hard facts on space time. Last week, we wrapped up our conversation on dark energy, talking about anti-gravity, negative pressure, and conservation of energy. You guys had some pretty deep comments. 4798 Alexander 4798 asks, is the universe behaving its way because math? Or is math behaving its way because universe? Whoa, mind blown. This is a pretty fundamental question. My guess, the universe doesn't know any math. It failed pre-calc. It wouldn't know a hypotenuse if you slapped it with one. Mathematics is a model that we use to describe the behavior of the universe. The astonishing thing is that it has such incredible predictive power. Ryan Lidster and a few others have wondered whether the energy lost in the cosmological redshift of photons could account for the energy gained by dark energy. Okay, so to summarize, as the universe expands, the energy in matter in any one co-moving volume or expanding volume is conserved. It gets more spread out, but the matter doesn't disappear. But photons also get spread out and they get redshifted, so they do lose energy inversely proportional to the increasing scale factor. Now, Physics Girl has an excellent video describing this effect, link in the description. So could this lost energy become dark energy? No, the scales are way off. Photons make up only a tiny energetic contribution to the modern universe, far less even than baryonic matter, which itself is far less than dark energy. The radiation dominated era ended around 50,000 years after the Big Bang. These days, photons just don't have enough energy left to contribute, yet dark energy continues to be created. Eugene Kutyansky points out that the idea that energy is not conserved in an expanding universe is still pretty speculative. And yeah, there is some speculation here, but I don't think it's a speculative statement to say that the law of conservation of energy, as we learned when we studied Newtonian mechanics, is a feature of flat space-time. Curved space-time changes things. Even gravity, from a Newtonian perspective, requires the invention of a new quantity, gravitational potential energy, in order to preserve energy conservation. Described in general relativity, you can still come up with conserved quantities, energy analogies, that are invariant in, say, an expanding universe, but, for example, a stress-energy-momentum pseudotensor isn't mathematically the same thing as classical energy. This gets us back to the idea of whether the universe knows math. The universe is mechanistic and its behavior results in emergent mathematical laws that allow us to model and predict its behavior. Conservation of energy is one such law that works in flat space-time, but energy itself is not a thing. 
we draw energy life bars in our animation sometimes, but the universe doesn't have any hidden energy counter. It just acts according to deep and presumably very simple set of fundamental rules that give rise to mathematical relationships. And we shouldn't mistake those relationships as themselves being fundamental.